my friends, <clears throat> if you are visiting, if you are visiting with us, you are welcome here. And you are invited into the blessing of this community of love. We have entered the season of Lent in which we recognize as a time of examination of our own lives and the life of our community, the community of the church and the community of, of our world. I invite you into the work of Lent, into an examination of your life and the life you live in the community. And in this work, I invite you to care for yourself and to enter this work with care for the people around you. A good place to do this work, if you don't have an established way to do this work, is to consider um, giving some time every day to our daily meditations. They're focused on um, turning us inward and giving us a place to begin an examination in this way, a spiritual examination of our life. Um, so I'm inviting you to give your spiritual life some attention every day for the season of Lent. We don't say hallelujahs during Lent. Um, so this is the Sunday that we begin that. But if you slip up today, I think it's really okay. Because I think maybe this Lent, if any Lent, we need the hallelujahs slipping in um, and holding us together. So I hope that the examinations that we take on as individuals and that we take on collectively will draw forth an alleluia for us all in the days to come. Let us worship our God together. May God be with you. Let us pray. Holy One, as we enter the blessed season of Lent, grant us strength and courage for the examination of our lives. By your eternal love and mercy, may we find ourselves renewed, open-hearted, and bound to one another for our journey through the shadowlands. The way was mapped for us by Jesus the Christ, and the way is born in us by the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. And let us enter together the readings from Holy Scripture. A reading from Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let no one who look to you be put to shame. 
let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and in you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O God, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his, his covenant and his testimonies. This is a reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Mark is in a hurry. He is succinct to the point of terseness. He has a message to deliver and he's in a hurry to do it. He tells us what his message is going to be in the very first verse of his gospel. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's plan is to show that Jesus is the Son of God, and Mark wants to get straight to the story. I think today's gospel reading is the introduction to the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Remember, Mark does not have a birth narrative. His gospel opens with the words of Isaiah the prophet, and then moves right on to John, who is baptizing, baptizing and calling for repentance and announcing the coming of the one who is more powerful. And then Mark works quickly to introduce us to Jesus. Here's what he says. Jesus lives, leaves Nazareth. Jesus goes to the Jordan River on the edge of the Judean desert. 
Jesus is baptized by John. The spirit, the spirit descends and Jesus is blessed by God. That same spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness a long time with Satan, wild beasts, and angels. John is arrested, Jesus goes to Galilee, and Jesus announces the kingdom of God. All of that is in seven verses. And there's enough information in those seven verses for hundreds of sermons. And there have been hundreds of sermons. But because today is the first Sunday in Lent, and Lent is designed to be a time of introspection and self-reflection, and because our theme for Lent this year is the wisdom of the Shadowlands, I want to look at the story of Jesus in the wilderness. Now imagine this. Jesus comes up out of the Jordan River. He's dripping wet. The skies rip open and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove. And then there's this voice like thunder. You are my son, the beloved with you. I am well pleased. And immediately, Jesus, still dripping wet, is driven into the forbidding Judean desert. There's no time to bask in the affirmation from his Father in heaven. There's no time to talk to John or anybody else. There's no question about what happens next. Jesus is compelled to go into the wilderness by the very same spirit that descended upon him like a dove. Jesus, I think, is driven into the wilderness to come to terms with the announcement that he is the son of God, the anointed one. It seems that Jesus cannot preach or teach or heal or even announce the kingdom of God until he spends some time in the desert. The wild, dangerous place of temptation and wild animals. And Jesus is not out in the desert for a couple of days. He's out there for 40 days. It's a long time. He's been driven into the desert wasteland to find out who he is, to change his focus. For 30 years, he's been a craftsman in Nazareth. And now he is going to become the, the man God created him to be and to announce to the people the nearness of the kingdom of God. Mark tells us that Jesus has three companions out in the desert. But as usual, he offers no explanation. <laughs> Mark leaves this to our imaginations. Satan the tempter is out in the desert. That's all Mark tells us. I think we have a tendency to externalize those temptations and make them about behavior. But I think temptations are more internal. The temptation to not really accept in our hearts that we are God's child. The temptation to not believe that we are beloved of God. The temptation to believe that we're self-sufficient. The temptation to believe that we will never be good enough. The temptation to avoid at all costs the hard internal work. 
Secondly, Mark tells us the wild animals are in the desert. And we don't have any idea why Mark put that in there. Maybe Mark put it in there to let us know how physically dangerous the wilderness is. Maybe Mark was thinking about Noah and the fact that the wild animals actually got saved during the flood, saved as in put on the ark. Maybe Mark puts it in there to tell us that God is present even with the wild animals. We don't know. We just know they were there. And finally, Mark says that Jesus was waited on by angels. Angels often appear in the desert. The Hebrew scriptures are full of examples. An angel appeared to Hagar and Ishmael when they were driven into the desert. An angel appeared to Moses in the burning bush. An angel cared for Elijah when he fled into the desert to escape the wrath of Jezebel. God sent angels to take care of the very human Jesus. Mark's story is short and spare, and he was writing about Jesus. What does it have to do with us? I think if we are honest with ourselves, we do our dead level best to avoid the wilderness, especially the wilderness of our own interiority. That's where we are forced to see ourselves as we really are. But that's also where we meet the holy. During this Lenten season, we are tempted to just go through the motions to give up chocolate or social media, but to skirt around the edges of the wilderness, to avoid engaging with the wild places in our lives and in the world. But if we're really able and ready to embrace Lent, if we're to be renewed to new possibilities, if we're to hope again, we have to go into the wild. And we have lots of people who went before us. Abraham and Sarah were called to leave home and they went out into the wilderness. The people of Israel wandered around in the desert for 40 years before finding home. Noah and his family sailed on the wild sea for 40 days and Jesus spent 40 days in the Judean desert, but not one of them was by themselves. God journeyed with them just as he journeys with us. And if you are honest with yourself, you know deep down inside that you need this time in the wilderness. We know deep in our bones that the desert is calling, demanding even, that we spend time looking at ourselves, not just as individuals, but as a community of faith particularly after this year of upheaval and pandemic, we have to spend time looking at ourselves to discover new life, new ministry, and new ways of being the people of God. We long for things to stay the same. We long to get back to normal. But God is calling us to a new future, to new ways of being. And we can't get to the new future without letting go of the past. God has work for us to do. And that work begins when we, like Jesus, go to the wild places of discovery. 
Bishop Dion Johnson of the Diocese of Missouri says it well. We go to the wilderness to discover anew the joy of being loved. We go to learn once more what it means to be and to live as beloved. We go to listen to the voice of God calling us again. We go to see Christ more clearly in the world around us. We go because that is where we encounter God. We go to the wilderness because we can no longer be as we have always been. God's work begins with this Holy Spirit pesky Holy Spirit, dragging, driving, and drawing us out into the wilderness. Jesus has been there. The angels are there. His footsteps can still be found. Out in the wilderness, we're faced with temptations but God is there and Jesus has gone before. The biggest temptation of all is to not enter the wilderness. Amen. As a people, let us pray together. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, Michael and Jose, for this gathering, and for our ministers, Judith and Christy and Bruce, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially those who have died of COVID-19, who have had to die alone. Pray for those who have died. We pray especially today for the life of Virginia, Banta Whitener's mother and mother-in-law to Bruce Grobe. We pray today for those with confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19, Shelly, Cheryl, Jim and Sharon, John, Olivia, and Ross. For others that we hold in prayer, 
Charles, Charles, Sam, Christine, Susan, Jim, John, Janice, David, Daniel, Emily, Courtney, John, Rachel, Gerald, Jean, Cindy, Mark, Becky, Rick, Keith, Bennett, Fran, Lindsay, Maxella, the Browning and Coates families, Angela, Melanie, and Karen. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially Hildegard of Bingen, whom we remember today. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, in your compassion. Forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us in all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with all the faithful in every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say together, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you gracious God and creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. And we would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation. We abused one another and we rejected your love. Yet you never cease to care for us and prepare the way for salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus, born into the human family and dwelling among us. He, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus, born into the human family and dwelling among us. He revealed your glory, giving himself freely to death on the cross. He triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. 
On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world and bring us into the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. So with Hildegard and James and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ, Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. My friends, we have the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. So though we are apart, we share the body of Christ. I am. Though we are separate, we are not apart. We share the blood of Christ. We are. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your life may be a light to the world. And may what is divine and what is human be brought together in you by everything that is love, this day and always. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Uh, got just a